This is Sharon Miller, recording for my short story, The Little Grasshopper. We lived in a camp in the hills above Port of Spain, and they let us keep one of the kittens. The kitten was like our baby, and we passed it from hand to hand, rocking it and feeding it from our plates. Daniel said we were in the foothills of the northern range, and that this range was an extension of the Andean Ridge. This made me feel a little less homesick. There were 12 of us girls at the camp and two older women who cooked for us. Three of us were Venezuelan, four were from Colombia, and the youngest five were from the Dominican Republic. One was so young, I wasn't sure she'd seen her first blood yet. She still sucked her thumb when she slept. Whoever picked us had an eye. We were all pretty, all shades and colors, black and white blonde and dark-haired. It was not too bad, really, except when they put us to lie down in the back seat of cars and transported us around the country. I'd done ballet for a long time at home, so I was always a dancer. But, of course, we had to do lots of other things as well. Daniel worked for El Jefe Grande, the big boss. Chael was a good businessman. Lots of important people came to see him. When this happened, we wore short skirts and served tea and coffee and the cakes that the Trinidadian ladies had made for the visitors. Some of the girls said the men were from the government, but I couldn't believe that. Do you think we could ask them to send a letter for us? The day I asked that, one of the Colombians slapped me very hard. Others were rich businessmen who were interested in one of us but also wanted to order a Siberian husky or a Siamese cat from the mainland. I was the one that had the ideas, dreams really, not the dreams that you would expect a 17-year-old to have, but dream, dreams change when life changes. I thought Daniel could get just as rich as Chael, and then we would be free. Daniel was very good at his job. He was good on the boats, good with the girls and the animals, and Chael loved him. Chael trusted Daniel so much that he allowed him to take me for walks off the compound. I'd had one boyfriend in Venezuela when I was 14, but I hadn't had much experience with boys until I came to Trinidad. Now I had too much experience. But when I was with Daniel, I forgot all of that and felt like a normal girl again. Once a week, a doctor came from Port of Spain and examined us. There were 12 beds with stirrups to place your feet. Not the kind of stirrups that you use when you ride a horse. No, these were upside-down stirrups so that the doctor could spread you wide and shine a torch into your darkness as if he was looking for your soul. The doctor made sure we were healthy and that we all took our pill each month. All of us took a pill except for the one who still sucked her thumb, but she still had to lie in stirrups as well. If I turned my head and squinted my eyes, the rows of knees spreading away from me blurred into the tops of hills, making their way back to the Andes. I learned to relax and imagine that I was hopping knee to knee all the way back to my home. I was the reason Daniel was in trouble. I started it. There was an important man who liked me. Every Tuesday, he sent a big car for me and had me taken up a back elevator into a room at the Hyatt Hotel. I knew he was a very important man and that Chael must have collected a lot of money for these visits because all day on Monday, the girls fussed over me. They painted my nails and curled my hair. I was as hairless as a newborn mouse by the time they'd finished their waxing and tweezing. Every Tuesday afternoon, he would lay me out like a doll and examine me from head to toe before he lay on top of me. It was not as humiliating as a torch but sometimes I still cried. After he was finished with me, he'd let me order whatever I wanted from room service. I'd try and eat the money that would never come to me. Lobster, steak, sushi. I couldn't speak very well, but I was a good listener. I lay on the bed Tuesday after Tuesday, eating everything expensive on the menu and listening to the man talk in his booming voice on the phone. He was buying cocaine too. That was okay. All the men around me were always buying or selling cocaine. But this one was different. He was using the government's money to buy it. 
and I told Daniel, You're smart, I said. Maybe you can cut a deal with the suppliers. They know you're ready. How do you think Chael started? He must have had to take a risk as well. Sometimes late at night, the rain comes down in a heavy rush and the frogs scream and scream. This is the sound of home. These are the nights I cry and remember my mama and wonder if she knows I am still alive. When any of us cry, the Trinidadian ladies take us for a walk. Once I saw the younger lady rocking the little Dominicano like a baby. When I walked by, I could see she was crying, the Trinidadian, not the Dominicano. After that, I liked a bit more and began following her around like I used to follow my mother. Once we got a Ukrainian, she'd come in a crate like a dog and she was very sick. Shail was very angry and threw his cell phone across the room. She didn't stay with us very long and they never even got a table with stirrups for her. One day when she woke, she was gone. So how does it work, this whole thing? Sometimes the men try to ask me where I come from, how I came to be. No entiendo, I say. I don't understand. But I do. I know exactly what they are asking. They are asking, are you really a slave? How can that be? When we are not working, we brush each other's hair and make facial masks from the mangoes and avocados that drop like men on the roof at night. I wonder what will happen to us when we are no longer young and pretty. And that is when I start to think of the future. The younger Trinidadian's name is Isis, and she says her name with pride. I like her very much because she makes nice things like fudge for us, and she waits up for us when we come in late. Sometimes she comes into the bedroom with us, even if it is long after midnight. There she helps us undress with hands like a mother, examines us for signs of hurt, and helps us wash the stink of men off our bodies. We trust her. On the night we, we rest, she tells us stories. We bring our pillows and blankets out onto the big veranda and listen to the rain fall and the sound of her voice. She tells us about sukuyas. What? We shriek as if we should be more afraid of a woman who sheds her skin and turns into a ball of fire than we are of the men who run our lives. Do you want to hear a story about a sukuya called Eliana, she asks. Yes, we chorus back as excited as preschoolers. Well, this is a tale of Eliana who was a young girl just like you, but she was different. She was a sukuya. And right then, I wish with all my heart that I could shed my skin and turn into a ball of fire and drink the blood of bad men before burning them away. How do you become a sukuya, I ask? You must be born with the power to shed your skin. But some women learn other skills, and that makes them just as powerful as sukuyas. And that was when I decided I would make myself into a sukuya, so that men far and wide would fear the sound of my name. But haven't we already shed our skins by being here, I asked her. This is not my skin that I live in. Soon you will learn how to live in this new skin, she tells me. But for now, listen to the tale of Ileana.